Hello everybody, it's time to carry on with James and the giant peach. And if you remember, the peach has just fallen off the tree with James and all the animals inside and has started rolling down the hill. So chapter 15. Outside in the garden at that very moment, Aunt Sponge and Aunt Spike had just taken their places out with their big book of tickets, ready to collect money from all the visitors. If you remember, they were trying to make as much money as they possibly could. And indeed, the first stream of early morning sightseers was visible in the distance, climbing up the hill to view the peach. We shall make a fortune today, said Aunt Spiker. Just look at all those people. I wonder what became that horrid little boy of ours last night, Aunt Sponge said. He never did come back in, did he? He probably fell down in the dark and broke his leg. Aunt Spiker said. Or his neck, maybe, Aunt Sponge said, hopefully. Just wait till I get my hands on him, Aunt Spiker said, waving her cane. He'll never want to stay out all night again by the time I finish with him. Oh, it's not there. so awful, aren't it? Good gracious me, what's that awful noise? Both women swung round to look. The noise, of course, had been caused by the giant peach crashing through the fence that surrounded it. And now, gathering speed every second, it came rolling across the garden towards the place where Aunt Sponge and Aunt Spiker were standing. They gaped, they screamed, they started to run, they panicked, they both got in each other's way. They began pushing and jostling, each one of them was thinking only about saving herself, so no surprise there, right? Eh? Aunt Sponge, the fat one, tripped over a box that she'd brought along to keep the money in and fell, woof, flat on her face. Aunt Spiker immediately, whoops, tripped over Aunt Sponge and came down on top of her. They both lay on the ground, fighting and clawing and yelling and struggling frantically to get up again. But before they could do this, the mighty peach was upon them. There was a crunch, and then there was silence. The peach rolled on, and behind it, Aunt Sponge and Aunt Spiker lay ironed out upon the grass as flat and thin and lifeless as a couple of paper dolls cut out from a book. And that is the end of Aunt Sponge and Aunt Spiker. Thank goodness. So they can never be horrible to anybody, including any children, ever again. And now the peach had broken out of the garden and was over the edge of the hill, rolling and bouncing down the steep slope at a terrific pace. Faster and faster it went, and the crowds of people who climbed the hill suddenly caught sight of this terrible monster plunging down upon them, and they screamed and they shouted, and they, they dashed to the right and the left as it went hurtling by. At the bottom of the hill, it charged across the road, knocking over a telegraph pole and flattening two parked cars as it went by. Then it rushed madly across about 20 fields, breaking down all the fences and all the hedges in its way. It went right through the middle of a herd of fine Jersey cows, then through a flock of sheep, then through another field full of horses, then through a yard full of pigs. And soon the whole countryside was a seething mass of panic-stricken animals stampeding in all directions. The peach was still going at a tremendous speed with no signs of slowing down. And about a mile further on, it came to the village. Down the main street of the village it rolled with people leaping frantically out of its path, right and left, and at the end of the street, it went crashing right through the wall of an enormous building and out the other side, leaving two gaping round holes in the brickwork. Now this building happened to be a famous factory where they made chocolate. And almost at once a great river of warmed, melted chocolate came pouring out of the holes in the factory wall. Now do we know a factory where they make chocolate, and where there is a river of molten chocolate. I wonder if that is Mr Willy Wonka's factory. Do you remember the one that Charlie visits in Charlie and the Chocolate Factory? I don't know. It could be, couldn't it? It can't be many factories that make chocolate that have got a river of chocolate in them. A moment later, this brown sticky mess was flowing through every street in the village, oozing under the doors of the houses, into people's shops and gardens. Children were wading up to their knees. Some of the children were even trying to swim in it. And all of them oh, were sucking in through their mouths in great greedy gulps and shrieking with joy. 
but the peach rushed on across the countryside, on and on and on, leaving a trail of destruction in its wake. Cowsheds, stables, pigsties, barns, bungalows, hay racks, anything that got in his way went toppling over like a ninepin. An old man sitting quietly beside a stream had his fishing rod whisked out of his hands as he went dashing by. And a woman called Daisy Entwistle was standing so close to it as it passed, she had the skin taken off the tip of her long nose. Would it ever stop? Well, why should it if it's going downhill? A round object will always keep on rolling as long as it's on a downhill slope. And in this case, the land sloped downhill all the way until it reached the ocean. The same ocean that James, you remember, he begged his aunt to let him go to the seaside by the beach. Well, maybe he's going to visit the seaside today. The peach was rushing closer and closer every second. Oh, oh dear. And closer also to the towering white cliffs that came first. These cliffs are the most famous in the whole of England and they are hundreds of feet high. Below them the sea is deep and cold and hungry. Many ships have been swallowed up and lost forever on this part of the coast and the men in them as well. The peach is now only a hundred yards away from the cliff. Now it was fifty, now it was twenty, now ten, now five. And when it reached the edge of the cliff, it seemed to leap up into the sky and just float there, just for a second, float there in the air. It'd be like, it was. you can imagine everything sort of, it was happening in slow motion. And the peach, it just turned over and over and then it began to fall down, 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 down. Smack! It hit the water with a colossal splash and sank like a stone. But a few seconds later, whoop, up it came, and this time up it stayed, floating serenely upon the surface of the water. And there you can see the peach coming off the top of the cliff with the sea all the way down the bottom. We've got time. Shall we see what happens to James? Because it can't be very comfortable for him, shall we? So this is chapter 17. At this moment, the scene inside the peach itself was one of indescribable chaos. James Henry Trotter was lying bruised and battered on the floor of the room amongst a tangled mass of centipede and earthworm <coughs> and spider, 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 it's not a spider, is it? Spider and ladybird and glowworm and, of course, old green grasshopper. In the whole history of the world, no travellers had ever had a more terrible journey than these unfortunate creatures. It started out all right, with much laughing and shouting for the first few seconds, because the peach was very slow initially, so they might fall over, but it's a bit of fun, isn't it? But as it went further forward, they tumbled around, bump, the centipede shouted, that was Aunt Sponge, and then bump again, that was Aunt Spiker. And there'd be a tremendous burst of cheering when that happened, as you can imagine. But as soon as the peach rolled out of the garden and began to go to the steep hill, rushing and plunging and bounding badly downwards, then the whole thing became a nightmare. James found himself being flung up against the ceiling, then back onto the floor, then someone against a wall, up the ceiling again, up and down and back and forth and round and round. And at the same time, all the other creatures were flying through the air in every direction. And so were the chairs and the sofa, not to mention the 42 boots belonging to the centipede. Everything and all of them were being rattled around like peas inside an enormous rattle that was being rattled by a mad giant who refused to stop. Or like being in the, in the washing machine. I mean, you watch your clothes in the washing machine, how they all get thrown around, don't they? That's why you should never get in one yourself. It'd be ridiculous. To make it worse, something went wrong with the glowworm's lighting system and the whole room became pitchy darkness. I think that the glowworm was frightened and that turned the light off. There were screams and yells and curses and cries of pain and everything kept going round and round. And once James made a frantic grab at some thick bars sticking out from the wall, only to find there were a couple of the centipede's legs. Let go, you idiot! shouted the centipede, kicking himself free. And James had promptly flung across the room into the old green grasshopper's horny lap. Twice he got tangled up in Miss Spider's legs. A horrible business. And towards the end, the poor earthworm, who was cracking himself like a whip every time he flew through... 
pardon me, every time he flew through the air. That's not easy to say, is it? Flew through the air from one side to the other, coiled himself around James's body in a panic and refused to unwind. Oh, it was a frantic and terrible trip. But it was all over now and the room was suddenly very still and quiet. Everybody was beginning slowly and painfully to disentangle himself from everybody else. And you can just see in the picture there, the chaos inside the peach stone. Let's have some light, shouted the centipede. Yes, they cried, light, give us some light. I'm trying, answered the poor glowworm. I'm doing my best, please be patient. They all waited in silence. And then a faint greenish light began to glimmer out of the glowworm's tail. And this gradually became stronger and stronger. Until it was anyway enough to see by. Some great journey, the centipede said, limping across the room. I shall never be the same again, murmured the earthworm. Nor I, the ladybird said. It's taken years of my life. But my dear friends, cried the old green grasshopper, trying to be cheerful. We are there. <clears throat> where, they asked. Where? Where is there? I don't know, the old green grasshopper said. But I'll bet it's somewhere good. We are probably at the bottom of a coal mine. The earthworm said gloomily. We certainly went down and down and down very suddenly at the last moment. I felt it in my stomach. I still feel it. Well, perhaps we're in the middle of a beautiful country full of songs and music, the old green grasshopper said. Or near the seashore, said James eagerly, with lots of other children down on the sand for me to play with. Well, he's the nearest to me, right, isn't he? Uh, pardon me, murmured the ladybird, turning a truffle forward. Am I wrong in thinking that we seem to be bobbing up and down? Bobbing up and down, they cried. What on earth do you mean? You're still giddy from your journey, the old green grasshopper told her. You'll get over in a minute. Is everybody ready to go upstairs now and take a look round? Well, yes, yes, they called. Come on, let's go. I refuse to show myself out of doors in my bare feet, the centimede said. I have to get my boots on again first. Oh, for heaven's sake, let's not go through all that nonsense again, the earthworm said. Uh, let's all lend the centipede a hand and get it over with, the ladybird said. Come on, she's obviously the, the sensible one, isn't she, the ladybird? And so they did, also Miss Spider, who set about weaving a long rope ladder that would reach from the floor up to the hole in the ceiling. The old green grasshopper had wisely said they must not risk going out of the side entrance when they didn't know where they were, but must first of all go up onto the top of the peach and have a look around, because they don't want to end up coming out under the sea, do they? So half an hour later, when the rope ladder had been finished and hung, the 40-second boot had been laced neatly onto the centipede's 40-second foot, they were all ready to go out. Amidst mounting excitement and shouts of, Here we go, boys, the promised land, I can't wait to see it! The whole company climbed up the ladder one by one and disappeared into a dark, soggy tunnel in the ceiling that went steeply, almost vertically, upwards. I'm going to have to stop it there because it's, otherwise I won't be able to save it all. But come back next time. We'll find out what they could see and their adventures on the ocean. Be happy. See you soon.